We get to start a new series. Yeah, who's excited for a new series this morning? It's going to be awesome. Awesome. We got like one row over here. Who's excited to start a new series this morning? Dollars and discipleship is we're going to be talking, and uh, we get to just have like a little conversation. So yeah. over the next little bit, we're going to have a conversation uh, about giving and generosity, right. tithing, things like financial management, and just share with you our story. And we're going to get really honest and really vulnerable with right. you and share the highs. And we're also going to share the <laughs> lowest of lows of some, and how we went from being newlyweds in 2005, uh, Brooke quickly getting pregnant with Aiden shortly after we got married. Then Easton comes on the way all the while living on no income, <laughs> charging. And we had this big monkey on our back called crushing credit card debt. Right. And, uh, and it really started a few months into our marriage. We just started making poor choices yeah. fast. And accumulate with it. Before we even knew it, we had accumulated eighteen thousand dollars worth of credit card debt, and uh, now a large car payment, and all on an income of just a shade under fifteen hundred dollars a month. So, if you are here today and you are in a desperate situation, know that there is hope for you. Uh, there was hope for us. This wasn't an isolated incident. Um, we are a living witness and testimony to what God can do when you allow Him to get involved yes. in your finances. It's true. And um, we had to start changing our beliefs about finances, how we looked at them, how we talked about them, and we really had to start putting God at the very forefront. At of the very that. beginning. At the very from top. the very very beginning, and uh, we now. <laughs> at, Today, going from 18 years ago, we were uh, barely making ends meet. Now, we give extravagantly more than we made uh, in those years. Yeah. It's and crazy to think that now we give every single year to build the kingdom of God right. more than we earned every year when we first got right. married. And some of you are going to be sitting here going, I don't need to know that. I hope that encourages your heart right. And uh, because our story didn't begin well. Right. And um, we began with us choosing to get married. Now, that part was good. Yeah. Um, and so. that part was good. <laughs> and... Uh, but it chose. We also began choosing to go on a honeymoon, right. and uh, we had saved and saved and saved because we wanted to go to New, New York, York City. City. Yeah. And uh, you know, and it wasn't just because we wanted to go to New York City because we thought New York City is cool. It is one of our favorite places, but we really had to go somewhere um, that we didn't need to rent a car because yeah. we, we were public not, transportation. We were not old enough to rent a car yeah. at that Some point. Some of you know so, the struggle is real. Come right? on. We Some were, of you know the struggle. We were just 20 and 21. And so if you don't know, you have to be 25 to rent a car. And we could not rent a car. So we needed some place with public transportation or a taxi. Before Uber. Before Uber was in, in a thing at that point. But we were so young. Well, Alex. I'm going to say Alex was so young. And I was dumb. <laughs> Uh, that he went to New York City in the dead of winter, December 31st, without a coat or a hoodie of any kind, really any long sleeves. Anything. I literally, and, you would have thought it was summer in Kansas. I mean, it right? was like, uh, yes. and flew all the way to New York City, didn't even, tell, that's an absolute true story. And so our first big expense, we land in New York City and we get down to our hotel and we're like excited about seeing the ball drop. That was right. like her dream. And I'm like, I'm just enduring it because I could really care less. And uh, it starts snowing and sleeting. And so our first big expense is we got to go find a coat. Now, right. I, winter coats are not cheap. Talk about winter coat on New Year's Eve in, on Times Square on it's New really Year's Eve. not cheap. Now, we had saved and prepared to pay cash for our entire trip. We had saved right. and saved and saved. Even had saved extra for those like unknown expenses. Now, we had no idea that first unknown expense was going to be Alex's a winter coat. coat. And, uh, but backtrack just a little bit. A few weeks before our wedding, Bank of America gives me a credit card and says, hey, we trust you enough that we're going to lend you $15,000 or put that at your, ex at, at your availability to spend, but we're going to give you a kick-in of a 1% cash back. So, yeah, I'm 19 when the credit card gets in my possession. Uh, they had to have known that I was going to be dumb enough and forget that I'm going to take a coat into New York City in the winter. Uh, they had to, but no, you're... You can't rent a car. Yeah, I can't rent a car. You could maybe pay back $15,000 worth of But I was trustworthy enough to have a $15,000 credit card. <laughs> right, so, our, so our, our thought process was, let's go to, to New York. We have the cash to, to pay for our honeymoon, but let's go to New York. Let's put it on the card, yep. and we will have Bank of America pay for a few of our fun activities that we're going to do while we're in New York City, get that 1% cash back. Pay and off the card when we get pay back. Pay off the card when we get back. But that's not the way that's the story not, went. No, no, because we were young. And right. uh, we get back from our honeymoon and both realizing that we are uh, driving four-door Honda Accords, both, you know, sedans. And I know that is the Lord's car. <laughs> Scripture says they gathered in one Accord. We, we, drove, in on one, we drove in two Accords. 
Uh, and so we decided we don't need two sedans. Let's go buy a bigger vehicle. So right. we're broke as a joke walking on to a new car dealership. And next thing you know, all the money that we had sitting in our bank account that was supposed to pay the credit card is now going to a new car dealership to right. get a 1997 Nissan yes. Pathfinder Limited yes. Edition. Yes. Leather seats, heated seats, yes. that was sunroof. That new thing for us. Oh, man. Heated seats was yeah. top notch And, and we went in with a budget, Right. And we didn't really, it was quickly we realized a payment is not an affordable budget. Right. And we knew what we had available to spend in the bank account, but we didn't go in knowing that that money actually already had a name and it was already spoken for. Right. But So now we have a car payment and out here in left field is this Bank of America credit card bill, which is all of our honeymoon. Right. So we added a $300 a month car payment and we definitely couldn't afford it. And before we knew it, we were treading water so fast yeah. and it happened almost overnight. And we were proud people. Mm -hmm. I'll put it to you that way. We didn't want anybody to know we were struggling. Right. We didn't want anybody to know we were having issues. So every time someone invited us out to eat, the answer was always, of yes, course. Of course. And we would go and we would eat like we, mom and dad were still paying the bill. <laughs> and then Bank of America would come to the rescue and we would just swipe Charge that it. card. Right. Because the people who invited us out to eat, they weren't going to McDonald's for the dollar menu. No. <laughs> they weren't going to Taco Bell for the 10 tacos for five bucks. Some of you yeah. maybe remember those days. <laughs> They were going to places like Outback Steakhouse, which is one of our favorites. There's a big difference between buying that $15 steak when mom and dad are paying the bill. Right. Now we're married and we have to pay that bill. Right. And so we pretty quickly learned that finances weren't going to get healthier by chance. They had to get healthier by change. Yep. And we had to start changing. We went from healthy and prepared to unhealthy and treading water. Felt like overnight. Overnight. And With we, a car payment? Yeah, we had a car payment. We had rent. We had all the things that needed to be paid. Car insurance went up. Yeah. Fuel bill went up. All the up, things. Everything. And so the first thing that we had to do was we had to start communicating. Um, we had to have some really tough conversations with each other. It wasn't fun. Um, I don't know about you, but in marriage, uh, the financial conversation is not the most fun conversation to have. Um, maybe that's just our household. But I, I um, enjoy them. He likes that. I enjoy them. <laughs> There's some that like that conversation. I hate that conversation. But we knew we had to have that conversation so and, that we it, could start making some changes. And it makes it tough to have that conversation when you know you have no money. Yeah. Like when you don't have money in the bank. It's really hard right. to sit down and talk about where to send money and, talk, right. and start directing money. Right. When you don't even have, right in the moment, your bank account is maybe even overdrawn, right. which ours was, was many, many, many times. many times. Yeah, and so we had to change the way we thought about our finances. We had to change the way we spent money, and we actually had to start budgeting. Like, start telling our money to where to go. It, telling our money, and we had to get on the same team without pointing fingers at each other, without shooting arrows at each other, and um, beating each other up along the way. Yep, and there's a question you have to answer. And when you're in a tough spot, in a tough spot financially, and you have to be able to, especially if you're in a marriage, you have to be able to answer the question, how are we going to climb out of this hole? Yeah. But we usually let the question stop right there. But the truth is there's actually an extra step we have to take. How are we going to climb out of this hole together? together. And our communication and our, and our relationship had to go to a level it had never been to that point because we had gone from treading water to now feeling like we're drowning to now, 18, 19 years later, we're able to give extravagantly without any hesitation. Mm -hmm. But the most important lesson that we learned through this we, even when we felt like we were treading water and we didn't have, because we put God first, that conversation, we prayed God into the situation right. and we told God we were going to be faithful and you're going to have control. And we learned really early on that the first thing, the first lesson we have to yeah. learn is we can't afford to not give. We always faithfully tithe to right. our local church. That was not an option for us. Right. We said yes and there was no hesitation. Right. We knew that the tithe was what God was, biblical obedience, and that's what God was asking from us. And we knew that was 10%. Any less than that would be disobedience. Right. And so we said, God, we can't afford anything else, but we, what we can't afford is to not have you in our bank account. We right. can't not afford to have you in our life. And so right. we gave 10%. We, even when we didn't have rent to pay, right. when we had the utilities that were still due, there wasn't enough money in the bank. We said, God, we're going to give 10% to you because this is our storehouse. Right. This is our church. This is where our kids are going to be raised to love Jesus. Right. This is where we're going to be fed spiritually. We're not going to invest it anywhere else. We're going to pour in what you say right here at the storehouse. And we read that night, Malachi yeah. chapter three, bring all of the tithe to the storehouse. That's your local church so that there will be enough food in my temple. 
Okay? Yeah. If you do, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, I will open the windows yeah. of heaven for you. Right. Like, hear me. This is what the Lord says. He will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing right. so great you won't even have enough room. You couldn't build a big enough right. house to take it in. And he says, the only time in scripture he says this, try me. Yeah. Put me to the test. We put, and that's what we said. We said, okay, God, yeah. we're going to take you at your word. Right. And so we chose... Uh, to do that, just that, take him at his word and to choose to tithe to our local church and not compromise in that. And uh, we couldn't afford it to, to not do it. Yeah. And we understood that. Um, and it was the full 10% and there was nothing less of that. And um, if it would, if we would have taken anything less, right. that would have been disobedience. Yeah. Simply put, scripture yeah. says it. If you give to less than 10%, that's disobedience. Right. And what we learned, if you were here a few months ago, Pastor Chanel preached a dynamite message <laughs> and she said this, delayed obedience is still disobedience. disobedience. And sure. so we knew we had to get that right. right. If, we didn't get, if we didn't get that right, truthfully, everything else for us, it didn't matter. It, right. And so that was the first thing that we had to get right in our finances and it wasn't an option. When we got a check, we wrote a check. Yep. And that's how old we are. We wrote a check. Um, and it was, it was hard. Yeah. And um, to consciously make that decision every single time we received a paycheck to turn around and write that paycheck right then and there so we wouldn't um, we wouldn't even waver would, in that. We wouldn't have an opportunity to send it or spend it Somewhere anywhere else. else. Yeah. And, be, and through this, while also being in a mountain of debt and not making very much money, we had peace throughout the entire right. journey. Because there's overwhelming peace that comes when you tithe with a proper attitude. 100%. When your perspective and your attitude is right and you're giving with a cheerful heart, right. there is so much peace that comes with right. it. And we had to remember it wasn't God who made us uh, make those decisions. <laughs> it wasn't God who was swiping that credit card. That was us. And so we couldn't get frustrated with God in that. It was us who were making the unwise choices. And we, had, we knew we had to do something differently if we wanted a different outcome. And we always had to make sure that we were on the same page. Mm -hmm. We always had to be unified. Right. And I can't stress that enough. Um, we have to be unified. And so making the decision to put God first, making the decision to tithe, and then being unified in that, I would make the assessment that in the room this morning, or maybe watching online, you're online watching live with us today, and you and your spouse or you and your fiance aren't currently on the same page about tithing. Mm -hmm. uh, some may be, they're just like not unified in that. What, uh, what advice would you give when one says, yes, we should do this, we should tithe? Mm -hmm. And the other says, absolutely not. What would you do if, if I were the one who said no? Sure. So I would know my personal convictions. I know what the Bible says. That's an obedience step. And I would take whatever it is that I was bringing into our household, um, and I would tithe off of that. That's where I would start. And I would compromise in other areas of our budget to be as unified as possible in any other, any other situation or any other a line item, if you will. But tithing from my income, no matter how big or how small, yep. I would be tithing off of that. If I was bringing in $10, I would be giving one back to God because I know that the Lord would bless that. Um, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 8, remember whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Mm. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Yep, so good. And God so is good. able to bless you. This is my favorite word. Abundantly. abundantly. Yes, so good. So, good. Uh, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So good. I am going to sow obedience. I'm going to sow faithfulness. Faithfulness. I would decide to tithe and yep. not compromise. And... Um, and then even if it was out of the little, especially if it was out of the little. Um, and I know some people feel like, oh, I'm only bringing it, you know, I'm only giving a dollar. Does that really even make a difference? Um, and it really does because it really is a matter of our heart. Yeah. And I actually would go a step farther in that and would say that a lot of people, especially when you're financially struggling, you're going to get, the, there's a feeling of embarrassment and, and um, humiliation that comes mm -hmm. when you're only putting like a dollar in the offering. Right. And it's like, this, there's no way this is making a difference. And I'm here to tell you I, hope you, I hope you hear our heart today, that if it's hard to give when you have a little, it'll be impossible for you to want to give without, the, without a miracle from the Lord when you have, if you were to get a lot. Right. And if you don't give when you have $10 to your name, trust me, you're probably not going to give if you had $10,000 yeah. to your name. And what's really cool about how God works and when you take him at his word, listen, I hope you hear us, is when you're faithful with the little scripture is clear, he will. It's not a matter of if, he, he will. will 
bring more. So bi- a blessing so big. And I'm here to tell you, most of our blessings are not finances. Right. Most of our blessings are yeah. favor in relationships, in our fe- health, in our family. But the blessings are so big, we couldn't build a house big enough to keep right. it all in. And don't mishear us. Tithing is not a get-rich scheme. It is not. <laughs> that is not what this is. That's not what it is. It's a matter of our heart, and it's an obedience step. Um, and it's an obedience step we had to take. And when we do decide to take those steps even when we have a little yep. um, and it seems so ign- insignificant for us I remember when we were writing our $35 tithe check each and every week it seems so insignificant we felt like really God does the church really need our $35 it was a little embarrassing yeah it was a little embarrassing does, does God God do you really need our $35, $35 really gonna do anything yeah are we really doing anything with this and the reality was is no the church didn't need our $35 God didn't even need our $35 uh, God needed our heart, God wanted and our heart. God, had, God wanted us in a posture to be able to receive blessing and favor from him, uh, but if he didn't know that he could yep. trust us with just a little bit, um, he definitely knew he wasn't going to abound in anything yeah. else. And for me personally, like this idea of ownership was really big for me because it's like, Lord, don't you know I worked hard for this money? Right. God, I, you know how much, how much labor I did with this? Right. And I had to start reading Psalms 50 and realize that, uh, and this is in Psalms 50, this is a base prayer. I'm going to tell you right now, this is a base prayer that Brooke and I pray over our lives right. still to this day, over our kids and even praying for their families that we want. And we pray this over our church almost right. every single week. Right. We get this, this and, and the psalmist David is saying this about God. God has no need of any bulls from your stall or any goats from your pen. He, every animal of the forest is his. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. He owns the cattle on a thousand yeah. hills. He knows every bird in the mountain. He knows all of the insects on the field. They are his. Right. It, 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 I love that, the psalm, that David said this. If he were hungry, he wouldn't tell us. <laughs> he wouldn't beg us for food. He's got his food. All everything in the world is his. Right. It is his. I had to learn in my heart that God doesn't need the money from my bank account. Right. We need the favor and blessing that comes with obedient and faithful living. Right, for sure. And it's so important for us to understand that when you're making $1,500 a month or $15,000 a month, um, the challenge is never really about the money. Yeah, never. It's, it's about the control and it's about the trust. Um, and the scripture is very clear about that. Matthew 6, 21 says, do not hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths or corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Uh, stockpile treasure in heaven where it is safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your heart is, is the place you will most want to be. The place where your treasure is. And when we invited God into the conversation from the very beginning, we said, God, you're what we treasure. When we chose to tithe, when it would have been easy to keep paying off debt or it would have been easy to keep hoarding and keeping in, we said, God, you're what we treasure. And that is what it is, because where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. Right. And so if my treasure is with my wants, if, if my treasure is in control, or my heart, then that's where my heart is going to be. If my right. treasure is to hoard, to keep, and to be greedy, mm-hmm. then that's, what, that's where our heart is going to be. And, and so I want to hit on this for just a little bit longer. And we had to keep God first. Right. Like the, if, if that, that was priority number one. Right. And being unified right. put us along with God in the same vehicle going in the same direction, with God as the pilot, with God as the the driver's seat. It was the first part of the puzzle. We couldn't try to do it on our own. But because we put God first and we did it together, it was amazing how much more debt we were able to pay off. It took us three years to pay off all of our debt on, a, on the same income. Like, isn't am- it, it shouldn't have happened. The shouldn't numbers happen. don't add up. It was amazing. And even at the end, we had money left over. Yeah. We, we were able to save. Every bill got paid. Right. And we were able to give at the same level. We were able to tithe and never yeah. missed one payment. Right. So the next step that we had to do is we had to start changing some of our behaviors. Uh, That was a big one for us. And because our financial situation wasn't going to get better by chance, but by change, we couldn't continue to write that tithe check and then continue to live in the same way that we had been living. Um, We couldn't just be like, okay, God, put some more money in my bank account because I still want that, you know, that Coke over here. or I want whatever it may be, this uh, drink, or I want to go out to eat all the time. We had to continually make choices and financial, uh, make wise choices and one of the best budgeting advice uh, pieces of advice that we got was healthy budgeting isn't about penny pinching. It's about knowing where your pennies are going. Hear us. Putting God at, for, at the top 
we had to create a, a spending plan, right. like a budget that said, which meant we needed to now introspect and we needed to inspect yeah. how much money was coming in yeah. versus how much money was going out. Yeah. Pennies matter. Yeah. Hear me, pennies matter. Right. Living within your means matters. And right. we weren't, and it wasn't that we couldn't spend money because right. we still did, yeah. right? We just now knew why we spent money. And because right. we invited God into the process, we now spent money with intentionality. Because, and you may be like, well, Pastor Alex, I, I, I don't read anywhere in Scripture where it specifically says I need to live by a budget. And, and by, if you want to go by technicality standpoint, you're absolutely right. But I want to read from you a Scripture that we use as to why we biblically, purposefully have a budget. And it comes from Proverbs 27, 23. Know the state of your flocks. Know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds. I can't know the state of my flock, which means I can't know the state of my family's financial portfolio unless I actually know what it is, which means I know how much money's coming in. I know how much money's going out. And knowledge is power unless we waste it. And pennies coming in, we got to know how many pennies are going out. Well, let's let's take that into today when you go to Walmart. Like this is this is my weakness. I'll run to Walmart and I spend a hundred dollars, and Alex will be like, "Hey, what'd you spend a hundred dollars on?" And I'm like, "I don't." It's like know. one bag of groceries I have right no now. No clue. I have no I, no idea what I've spent money on. We had to stop, and we still have to stop and Good. go. Is this something that we need? Is this something that we want? Is this something we can really even afford? Absolutely. And because we made sure to keep God involved from the very beginning. Yeah. And then we made sure we were on the same page. Mm -hmm. We were able to do and make every decision together. So we knew why money was getting spent and where it was getting spent. Because being divided on that was not a help. If we would have been divided, we would have eventually been destroyed. Division wasn't going to make any part of the situation any better. And that even was inclusive of us being unified in our giving. And for too many couples, I'm going to just speak with some honesty today, we're already divided on, like the culture is teaching our teenagers to walk into marriage with this attitude and the mentality of this is your money and this is their money. And we're divided already on how resources are invested. We're divided on how resources are spent. It's like the husband has their cash, the wife has their cash. Everything is separate Right. And so it's like, oh, hey, here's your paycheck. Here's my paycheck. Your half is going here. Their half is going here. And it is completely, first off, confusing, but also totally dividing your household. And it's, it's not going to last. And the division will eventually lead to your destruction. Right. And we've had married couples that have come to us. We had one that said this. They walked in and they were having struggles financially. And they were like, hey, listen, how do, how do, we, how do we get out of this poor decision making? And we start talking through things. And they're like, well, he, she, the wife pays 60% of the mortgage and the husband pays 40% of the mortgage. And Brooke and I are looking at each other. And we're pretty practical, down-to-earth people, right? Yeah. And we're like, that's confusing. How do you keep track of that? Right. And Because that's division. And a divided house will fall. I want you to hear me. A divided house. And if you are, maybe you're here today and you're saying, well, this is how my husband thinks or this is how I think. And the, the real one that's under the surface that will absolutely crack your foundation are in your marriage is this is what my husband values. This is what I value as the wife. This is what I value. Those words are divisive right. and will destroy you. Yeah, we have to really get unified first and foremost, but then we have to really realize what is the difference between wants and And needs. And during that season of of life, we had to really learn what was a want and and what what was was a need. And uh, we had to put our wants on the back burner, put them to the side for that time, and really get control over things before we could really even want those things. So good. And as we've thought back to that season of spending a lot more than we were earning, we found the more we evaluated the more we invested in our wants and neglected our needs. Right. And I remember my first birthday, and uh, we just got married. Aiden was here, and we had $100 in the bank. And maybe you're here today, and, 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 and that's where you're at. Listen, we're, we're there. We're with you. We get it. We remember. 
and uh, I'm opening up this card at my birthday dinner that we were paying that we couldn't afford to eat. <laughs> and, uh, and I open up the card from Brooke, and she got me a ticket to the KU men's basketball game against Missouri. Like, I mean, that's like bucket list number one. Like, that, as a KU fan, that's the game to go to, right? K-State will never be as big of a rival to us as Missouri. Can I get a what-what in the house today, right? And, and I'm looking at it because the ticket was $150, and I'm like, Brooke, how in the world did you do this? And then my next thought was, Why? why? Yeah. And he's like, why is, why did, why would you even do this? And, um, what we found was we were spending money on our wants and then begging for our needs. We would beg our family or we'd beg the church or we would beg anybody really who would listen to, we need help with gas or we need help with food. And, um, but you would never know that by the things that we wanted because we always found money for the things that we wanted. I don't know that there was another more humbling thing in my life than having to walk to my pastor and ask to to fill up my tank of gas because we were completely broke yeah. just after we went to a KU basketball game. Like, right. like that was humbling because we couldn't right. afford the car either. So, I mean, it was like the, the, our the decisions, our priorities were, were way, we were all messed up. And, right. and there were many times the person we begged was God. Yeah. There were many times we sat in our living room, we sat at the altar at church, we sat in the front row and worshiped, and we're like, God, we need you to magically and mysteriously just drop some more pennies into our bank. I know we've spent wrong. I, we, Lord, yeah. Lord, whatever that, Lord, we, I know I can't manage what I have now, but if you will just help me with more, I will be able to manage it later. And we found that the more we investigated, the more we invested in our wants and begged for our needs. And I would make the assessment today, if you find yourself in a season like we were in, Mm -hmm. if you were to do a real heart check and a real financial check of your bank account, your credit card statements, your debit card statements, you will probably find over the course of your journey, you have spent more on your wants at the expense and the neglect of your needs. And you may be here like, Pastor Alex, you, you've said from this platform many times that God will supply. I have. And Pastor Brooke has said that. And we'll keep saying that. But nowhere in Scripture does it say God is going to supply your wants. Yeah. Scripture yeah. says God will supply your needs. Philippians 4.19, my God will, yeah. love that word, will supply, liberally supply every need, fill until full, every need according to his riches yeah. in glory in Christ Jesus. It also says in Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much yep. more valuable than they? Yes. He will take care of you. He will provide for yes. you. He will uh, show up for you because Always how much does. more does he love you? you and uh, but he cannot be the lord of our life if he isn't the lord of our finances and when you get focused on your wants and i'm going to tell you this from a personal perspective because that's that's easy for me Uh, i can easily get greedy and i want the best of the best i want the nicest house i want the fastest car i'm here to tell you uh i will i drive by clinton lake all the time and i want the absolute boat that's going to go the fastest got the speakers that blare that you can hear from across the, I, I want that right and um steak dinners name brand clothing brooke and i both have a joint weakness which we both really like shoes and um but the lord had to change and challenge my heart we learned a heart of generosity will destroy a heart of greed. Right. And generosity is one of the ways in my life personally that the Lord keeps my heart in check. Right. And from, oh, not just wanting, but starting to covet and to idolize mm-hmm. and starting to put the possessions above God. Right. We had, when we start to compare, first off, it steals our joy, but also then we start to covet those things. We start to idolize and then we start to want those possessions more than we actually want God. And uh, there's nothing wrong. Don't mishear us. There's yep. nothing wrong with having those things. Yep. Uh, those nothing. are all great things if you can afford them. Uh, but in that season, we definitely couldn't. <laughs> couldn't afford anything. Couldn't but afford if it. you just saw our Bank of America credit card statement, you wouldn't have known that. You know what right. I'm talking about? Like if you just saw, you'd have been like, dude. And, and for some of you, you may be sitting here today going, man, Pastor Alex Brooke, why, do, why don't you just give us a 10-step list? Mm-hmm. Like we're in a season like of that. Or, or maybe you're in a season where you have plenty and you're not tithing. Why don't you just tell us what we need to do? Right. We're not going to give you that. And, and we're not going to give you these 10. This is not a 10-step program because this is a heart check. Yeah. And uh, all I can tell you is 
We put God first, right. which meant we tithed. Right. And you want to know how we started, and you want to know how then, then that is. That's, that's how we destroyed. Started. That's what cha- that's what gave us the authority and the power over our finances. And uh, when we got focused on our wants, then we started less focusing on God, and it got really easy to get greedy. And and it's going to be hard to yeah. make the decisions that are necessary. If you don't keep God first, right. because you're going to have no purpose. And our purpose was not to get rich. Yeah. Our purpose was not to have money in the bank. Our purpose was to be able to invest and build his kingdom and right. reach people for him. Right. And really give them all of us. Yes. And uh, it was painful at times. And there was, there's, uh, we learned at a ripe age of 22, 23, that um, God had to be in control. And if we didn't allow him, things were just going to continue to yep. spiral. And uh, through that hurt and through that struggle of how are we going to get through this, what we really found is what true trust really looked like in God and in each other. We learned a lot about each other. We learned um, how to interact about finances with each other. and Learned how to be teammates. Yeah. And then in God to know that he is faithful. And we started to pay off our debt little by little, chunk by chunk. Anything extra we had, we threw at it. And um, he proved himself faithful. Things that we didn't expect to come in, came in. And we were able to to knock down that debt as quickly as we possibly could. In just a few years. Yeah. And so if you want a math equation, if you're you're a numbers person like me, you want a math equation on how it worked. Okay, so I'm going to give you a simple math problem. Can I give you a simple math equation? Cool. I have the mic. I get to. Okay, it was God plus great value mac and cheese plus peanut butter sandwiches, okay? Listen, uh, we loved Outback Steakhouse, okay? But those meals got expensive fast. And there's a big difference, right, between paying $15 mom and dad's bill. So we went from the steakhouse to the mac and cheese house, and we couldn't even buy craft. We were that po. Right, we could have no more craft. Right, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we had all the good stuff. We couldn't buy that. We had to buy great value, right. which because all of our meals had to be fifty cents or less. Right, and I believe our situation would have been way worse had yeah. we not been unified in putting God first Absolutely. through that. Um, just as when we pray, we invite God into our situation. When we tithe, we invite Him into our right. financial so situation. True. So true. And um, right, and right into the struggle. Only uh, do what God can do when yeah. we allow and open up our heart and be get into a posture to be able to receive blessing. And our tithe puts God in the driver's seat. Right, yeah. And what we quickly found out is we can trust God with 90% more than we can trust ourselves with 100. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It was clear. Yeah. Our choices said we couldn't be trusted with God's resources. Yeah. And my question for you today is, can you be trusted with God's resources? That's a tough question to ask. Right. And some of you may be thinking in your heart, you're going, man, this doesn't make sense. You were giving almost $150 a month to your church. Why would you not give less and eat better or give less and pay off more debt? The moment if we would have taken that step, we would have immediately moved, removed God out of the driver's seat. Right. And yes, the macaroni and cheese nights were worth it. Totally yes, worth it. the peanut butter sandwiches were worth it. And will we do it again? Yeah. 100%. Without hesitation. 100%, because we knew God needed all of us. We needed the Lord to be the Lord of our finances so that he could, in turn, be the Lord of our life. And maybe you're here this morning, and at this very moment, I'm a, like, let's just, get, let's just get real for just a second. Uh, you're struggling financially. You're on your last penny, your last dime, your last nickel, uh, maybe your last $100 you have in the bank. And, and your first thing you've said in your mind when you started hearing us talk about giving was, I can't afford to do anything. And you guys don't even understand. I can't even afford to pay rent. I can't afford to pay utilities. I so there's no way dropping even a dollar into yeah. uh, giving to the kingdom of God. Um, and, and I want to share with you that scripture is actually incredibly clear in these times how we handle that. And we read in Mark chapter 12, Jesus sits down opposite the place where the offerings were being put. And he watched the crowd putting money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And so Jesus, being Jesus, gathers his disciples, never never is one to miss a teaching moment, says, listen, I'm going to tell you with honesty, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others Mm -hmm. because they gave out of their wealth 
But she gave out of her poverty where she put in everything that she had to live on. And so this poor widow walks in knowing the Lord was saying, you should give, be obedient, be faithful. I will, in, your, in response, bless, gave not just her last few pennies like to give. It was also her last few pennies to live. Right. And to know that the Lord was going to bless, that is faith to put God first, even when right. she had nothing left to give. And so, right. Brooke, if you would... And as just what, what could you say that would bring some encouragement and an excitement uh, for those that are on their last dime, their last nickel, their last penny? What, what, what is something you would say to them to increase their faith and trust that God will take care of them every time? Sure. So um, I remember a time when we were we had just written our tithe check and we'd seen God's faithfulness time and time again. But this particular time we had written our tithe check and we were down to our last ten dollars in our bank account <laughs> and we had five hundred dollars rent due hmm. that day. Um, we had extended our grace period, exhausted um, the grace period. And if we didn't pay by that the end of that day, then we were out the next month, and so we would have to find a new place to live. And uh, we with ten dollars in the with bank. ten dollars in the bank. It's really easy to we get a rental go. place with ten dollars. Um, I'm telling you. But we knew that God was going to have to show up for us, and so we had prayed. We had been talking with each other. What are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? And uh, I was at work making, making lunch for some daycare kids, and I stepped out of the kitchen to go feed them. And when I came back, I caught the eye of, you know, I caught out of the corner of my eye my purse sitting off to the side. And I was like, something's in my purse. I don't know what that is. So I went to investigate, and inside my purse was a bank envelope. And inside there was five crisp $100 bills. Um, the exact amount we needed to keep a roof over our head. And the exact way we had to pay it because yeah. we could only pay it by cash. Yeah, we had extended the grace period for a check. And so it definitely had to be cash. And so we were, uh, I just knew immediately that that blessing was a product of our biblical obedience. And um, we knew that God had shown up for us. Um, we knew that we had postured ourselves for blessing, and we can't expect blessing when we don't posture ourselves right. to receive it. That's so good. And we know that blessing so and true. favor don't follow fear and hesitation, but blessing and favor follow faithfulness and obedience. And, and hear us today. I hope you hear our hearts. We remember yeah. very vividly what right. life was like before we had $100 in the bank. Mm -hmm. And so for us to receive $500 in one setting, that was a that was third huge. of our monthly income. Right. Just like that. Yeah. So we knew immediately it was God. So I, I, I grabbed my phone and I'm calling Alex and, and saying, you won't believe what happened. And his immediate response is, you got fired, didn't huh. you? <laughs> now, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You got, you got to hear me. You got to hear this, right? I, I was a lot more skeptical and a lot more pessimistic. And maybe you're like me. When it rains, it pours, it feels like, right. you know. And so I'm like, we're broke. We can't afford to pay rent. We're getting ready to be evicted in the, this afternoon. So what else could go wrong? So I just assumed she had been fired. Been fired from my daycare cooking job. And if you get fired from cooking at a daycare. It's, it's got to be pretty bad. <laughs> but I was like, no, babe, it's a good thing our um, our our obedience had paid off and yeah. the Lord had provided. I need you to come to the church like right now. Come get this money. Go pay get our it, rent. Yeah, go pay our rent right this second. But there was a lesson for us to learn through this. Yeah. The Lord provided for us. But there was a lesson the Lord wanted to teach us too. Right. Because this was the very instance that everything really changed for us. Right. This is when our attitude towards money changed. Right. And that we said, you know what? We now, for the rest of our lives, want to be on the other side of this. Right. We want to be the one that God uses to bless people, right. and we want to be the one that is ready and willing and available and prepared right. to be able to say yes every time the Lord we said. We want to be the one so in tune with the yes. Holy Spirit to allow God's resources to work through us and not just hoard it for ourselves. And, and the Lord has brought us so far. We right. did not just get over this. We, we like The Lord it didn't, our, happen, overnight. didn't happen overnight, yeah. but I can tell you not right now and I, I, is that we've paid for more meals at restaurants than I can even begin to count. We have dropped $100 bills. We call them Pentecostal handshakes to where you shake somebody's hand and there's money that transfers from our hands to theirs, uh, people's pockets and their purses. When the Lord, we have postured ourselves in a way when the Lord says, yes, you need to. But it was a decision we made at that day to make yeah. the hard choices. And it may take us 15, 20 years to get there, right. but we're going to put in the hard work. We're going to change our decisions now. 
And because we knew the peace that was coming with tithing, right? right? That's where peace exists. Right. But we were ready to feel the endless joy right. that comes with being able to give above and beyond right. our tithe to where people's lives were being transformed. And we now become the answer to the prayer. We're now the miracle. The Lord is using us to be a part of the miracle for somebody right. else's life. Right. We wanted to live our, our life with open hands. Uh, we knew that we could trust God. He had proven himself faithful time and time again. There were times that we struggled along the way. Don't get me wrong. We have had to make financial cuts. We've yep. had to have budget meetings and, and, and cut in every, every area. We just had one a couple months ago and said, hey, we've got to cut in every area um, except for our tithing line that will never be cut. Our generosity it will line at the top. will only go up uh, from the, the, the number that's there. We want to be able to say yes to Jesus with absolutely no hesitation, right. like with no fear, right. no concern. Uh, we, we, and we've learned all the, throughout this, it's the Lord's money anyway. Yeah, right, yeah, right. And so when we get that right, then in essence, here's what's happening. When the Lord asks for it, he's just asking for what's already his to come back. Right. And uh, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Right. Like when we get that, I'm telling you, that's where peace and joy just right. come in real. Right. And so we knew we wanted to live with joy, uh, with being able to live with open hands, it was so much greater than living with the stress of scraping the bottom of the barrel every single month. And it wasn't something that's perfected. Generosity is never perfected. Yep. Uh, that's always ongoing and it's always uh, taking a next step. And it's, it's important to hear that tithing is not generosity. That yeah. is obedience. Tithing is obedience. Yes. Uh, extravagant above that, your next step, your next level, that is where you become generous and extravagant giver. Yeah. And that's been a non-negotiable for us. Yeah. Uh, it's a practice and a lifestyle because we've seen the fruit and the favor of God over and over and over again. Right. And so if you go back, as we bring this conversation to a close, as you go back to Arrowhead Drive in, Car in Carl Junction, Missouri, where we knew we were drowning, we knew things, something had to change. Right. Um, we were broke as a joke. We had children. Uh, Aiden was here. Easton was just a few months away, literally financially drowning every month. There were three things we made that we set as non-negotiables from there. Mm -hmm. And the first one was, we were never giving less than our tithe, less than the 10% right. to our local church. We were right. never going to compromise on that. And we still practice that to this very day right. without, without uh, we say that because that's where it starts that's for us. That's where it us. starts, yeah. Then we had to be unified. Uh, we were going to communicate over and over and over again. Uh, that wasn't something we had to realize we were on the same page. Yep. We were on the same team. That's we. Right. Um, we had Now we've gone from 18 years ago, just barely treading water, to now giving more uh, in a single year than we made that yeah. entire time. And that's uh, really cool to yeah. sit back and think about um, because we never in a million years, I don't think that we ever been, thought that no. we would be able to do that um, because we remember what it was like to not even know what $100 really looked like. To go from not even have $100 in the bank and to now both Brooke and I walk around everywhere we go with $100 cash, $100 bill sitting in our pocket, walking into every restaurant we go, everywhere we go, we say, Lord, who needs this? And we are ready to give it. Yeah. And I can't even begin to tell you how many we've given out. And we don't get tax credit for it. Yeah. Like we're not, we, we, I, that's, that's not what we're looking for. Yeah. And that's it's a sign of our transformed, transformed heart. heart. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that was, um, and our faithfulness and our obedience um, to God. We want the same for you. We know that there is uh, yes. so much more joy yes. on this side of yes. it. And we want that for you. Um, we want you to feel the peace that comes with being a giver and being a tither. Yeah, we don't want you to live paycheck to paycheck. No. Hear us, hear our hearts. We don't, and we don't want you to lay awake stressed at night about rent. Mm -hmm. And so we've been on both the receiving and the giving side of God's blessing. Right. And we can say with 100% assurance and, and with a heart that there is a lot more joy right. in being a blessing than needing a miracle. Right. And, but to get where we're at today, it took us putting God first. It took us being on the same page but the thing we had to do is it was time to change our behaviors. We had to change how we talked with each other about money. We had to change how we communicated and spent money, change how uh, we accounted. We actually had to account for money. But the most important change was we had to change who was in control of the money. Yeah, and we love getting our end of the year giving statements because it's fun to see and it's really cool to see um, how much God has been faithful because we never want to get a, a giving statement back that says that we've given less or equal, equal to, to the year before. We want to be able to see how faithful God truly is and be able, we can still eat, we can still put food on our, on our table, pay our mortgage and, and be able to put gas in our cars. It's really f fun to see that God is still 
continuing to be faithful to us because yeah. what we know is we can't outgive God. We say that a lot around here. We can't outgive God, but we can outgive ourselves. So true. And um, every year it's just another testament to God's faithfulness in our life. And we want for you to experience the same joy that comes with a purpose when we live life with open hands. Right. We started out with empty wallets and now we get to live life with open hands. Mm -hmm. And what the, the joy that comes when God is able to use you and that includes finances. I'm not, I'm, uh, this, this, is, this, is at a diff, this is different than serving on the dream team. This is different yeah, yeah. than coming and serving food at a food distribution. Yeah. Th this is different. There's a different joy yeah. when, you, when you know that the Lord is using you and it's making a legitimate, real, right. practical difference in someone's right. life. And we couldn't have done it if we didn't do it together. And right. so if you're here this morning and, and, and you and your marriage, you and your marriage, you need to be on the same page right. because your house will fall if you're not. Right. And, and also, but I was, we also want to add in, if you're single and you, you don't, you need to find somebody to have an accountability like to help you with that. Get with one of our life group leaders because they would love to walk the journey with you because right. you need somebody to hold you accountable because right. we couldn't have done it if we hadn't have done it together with right. God. Both right. of us being on the same page over and over again and because we took these two Proverbs at their word. We took God at his word where in the first one, it's Proverbs 22, 9. The generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. In Proverbs eleven twenty five, 25, it says, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So here our heart, we give and we share our story with you today because we want to make a difference and we want to reach people for Jesus. We give because we've already received blessing. And we have a heart. We give because we have a heart that longs to keep our treasure in God. And we give because we desire uh, to be faithful and obedient. And we give because we tell God every month, you have all of me. We give because we trust him with 90% <laughs> more than we trust ourselves with 100. It's so true. We put our, we give because we place our complete trust in him and don't waver. We give because we want the, the Lord to be the Lord of our lives, which means he has to be the Lord of our finances. We give because I'm telling you right now, we love the peace that comes with tithing. Yeah. We love that peace. Yeah. And we love the joy that comes with being an extravagant, with extravagant generosity. I went from being a full-time youth pastor, early 20s, wife, new boys, making $291.80 a week. Brooke was a full, was a part-time cook at a daycare, making minimum wage, didn't make much money, but she could make a mean Pillsbury frozen biscuit. I'm telling you right Watch now. Watch out. <laughs> and we went from drowning and treading water in just a few years to being extravagantly generous and continuing to find ways to continue to give more to God. We went from living paycheck to paycheck to giving more in one year than we made during that time. And we did it together. We yep. didn't do it by accident. Um, it, we did it by making wise choices along the way. And that wisest choice we made was putting God first. Right. He ha had to be the Lord of our bank account with right. little or with plenty. Right. The Lord had to take first place because right. he was our treasure. And we can't compromise on that. And we'll adjust every line down beneath that so that that line can only increase because that's faithfulness. It's right. like, Lord, we want you to keep using us to make a difference in someone else's life. Right. And we want that for you. We want so you to true. feel the overwhelming peace and the joy that comes with being faithful and obedient in your tithing. Yeah. And then we want you to take that next step because tithing is not the end. Yeah. We want you to feel, we want you to go from peaceful to joyful and knowing what extravagant generosity looks like because right. we believe that for you. Hear our hearts this morning. We know there is hope right. past the financial strife and stress you live in right now. And we've been there. We've lived it. And we're living testimonies that God can come in and miraculously flip the script and change your story. But you have to get the first things first and you have to get it right, which is putting God first because when we tithe, and then when we go into the extravagant generosity, knowing that now God is using us to build his kingdom by growing his church, because the church is the hope of the world. This is the place where people find freedom. This is the place where people experience grace. And God wants to use you. And we want you to feel the peace and the joy that comes in knowing God is using me to change lives.